the station working for you. This is WRTV News at 11, streaming now. First at 11, police in Louisville say two officers were shot tonight. Officials say a suspect is in custody and the officer's injuries are not believed to be life-threatening. This comes amid protest after investigators announced no charges will be filed in direct connection to the death of Breonna Taylor at the hands of police. The city is under curfew from 9 p.m. to 6.30 a.m. for the next 72 hours. Here in central Indiana, dozens of protesters marched through the streets of Bloomington in a demonstration organized just hours after today's announcement. WRTV's Cameron Riddle was there and met a Louisville native who was moved by the show of unity. Good evening. Protests continued tonight in Bloomington, stemming from the energy to our south in Louisville with the announcement of no charges in connection directly to Brianna Taylor's death. Students here in Bloomington are now back on campus and in town and took some time tonight to march throughout the streets of Bloomington. We caught up with a woman who is a student here at IU but is from Louisville. She said she is so proud to see her classmates, many of them white, join in on chants saying black lives do matter. I cried. You know, when I went to the first protest back at home and everything just went went down, I cried because it's it's good to see other people that aren't black protesting. That means a lot. That's unity. And we're reaching out to more than just us. We're going to become powerful and strong. And that's what we need. And as the protest continued here tonight, there were no issues. Everything did remain peaceful. Leaders of the organization tonight did ask protesters to go home as it got dark and to not leave alone. In Bloomington tonight, I'm Cameron Riddle, WRTV. Now to the latest on the toll COVID-19 is taking on Hoosier lives. 3,305 deaths in the state are now blamed on the virus. 10 newly reported deaths happened between last Wednesday and yesterday. 728 new positive cases were reported yesterday. A fraternity house on the IU campus in Bloomington will be closed through the summer of next year for violating measures to curb the spread of COVID. The Monroe County Health Department says an investigation found that members of Alpha Epsilon Pi intentionally allowed conditions that may spread the virus. The members are also suspected of not telling police the truth about their actions. The health department says investigators uncovered a pattern of behavior that put public health at risk. Indiana will move to stage five of the state's back on track plan on Saturday. Governor Eric Holka made the announcement at today's weekly briefing on the pandemic. The decision means indoor and outdoor venues, restaurants, bars and clubs can operate at full capacity. Social distancing measures will still be required. Gyms and personal service businesses can resume normal operations. Size limits on gatherings will be lifted, but organizers of events with more than 500 people will have to submit a written plan to their local health department. And while stage five starts Saturday, the statewide mask mandate is extended through October 17th. The state health commissioner says this is all possible due to declining reports of COVID cases. She says Hoosiers must continue taking precautions to keep it that way. All it takes is one outbreak or a group of people who don't wear masks or don't practice, practice social distancing and those numbers can spike quickly. So as we move into stage five, it's absolutely imperative that we remember that this is not a return to life the way we knew it in January or February. Indianapolis Mayor Joe Hogsett's office says Marion County plans to update its health order sometime this week. The county's restrictions have been stricter than the statewide guidelines. State officials also discussed steps being taken to address the ongoing economic impact of the pandemic. The Commissioner for Higher Education says an additional $25 million in CARES Act money will help fund tuition, free education and training opportunities. With the additional $25 million in funding that we've announced today, we can continue to help Hoosiers skill up or get a better job. I encourage all Hoosiers to take the next step to further their education and training. This funding must be used by December 30th, so officials are encouraging you to enroll soon. For more info, go to nextleveljobs.org. Now to the forecast, WRTV Chief Meteorologist Kevin Gregory joins us now tracking another beautiful day. Kevin.
and warmer temperatures as we go toward the first weekend of fall. It'll get confusing because our warmest temperatures will be over the weekend. We're at 57 in Kokomo. That's the cool spot. Warm spot, Delaware County, 66 in Muncie, dry everywhere and it will be through the day tomorrow okay bus stop first thing in the morning mid 50s lots of sunshine during the day tomorrow our headlines above average temperatures on your thursday that wind is still light out of the southwest and the sunshine will make it look good as well as feel good temperatures as you can see in the upper 70s the temperature trend after the weekend is like a ski slope it's pretty steep downhill <laughs> we'll talk about more details on that coming up. This is how you can start to get on the right path to begin to grow. That right path for some people begins with registering to vote. Marion County's Office of Public Health and Safety went to the Marion County Jail over the weekend to register inmates who qualify to vote under Indiana law. WRTV's Cornelius Hawker explains how this push is personal for the woman who leads these efforts. This is not work for me. This is my passion. That's Carlette Duffy on her role as director of reentry for the Office of Public Health and Safety. Doing this kind of work, even on a volunteer basis in the community, had had more of an impact on me than um, any type of other employment that I could have been doing. Part of her work takes her to the jails in Marion County. On Saturday, she and her team helped eligible inmates register to vote. They were very excited to do it, and it made them feel like they are a part of the process. That Because for each person that came through, we thank them for, for allowing their voice to be heard. Making sure the voiceless can find their voice is something very personal to Carlette. Being the first director of reentry who has a criminal history and who was um, um, incarcerated. So... In talking to them, I let them know I was where you are right now. And she wouldn't be leading these efforts if it wasn't for the process of voting. I was able to expunge my criminal history, and that is through legislation. That is through legislatures who are put in place because we vote. Carlette tells me the work she's doing is so more people who are in situations like she was in have more opportunities to change their lives for the better. My goal my, and my efforts are to do whatever I can in my capacity to lay a trail for those coming behind me that will make their walk a little easier. Working for you, Cornelius Hawker, WRTV. For everything you need to know ahead of the general election, go to the Vote in 2020 digital section of our website, WRTV.com. One election that we are following closely is two open school board seats in the Northwest Hendricks Corporation. That's because for more than a year, WRTV Investigates has been following controversy within the district. School leaders have faced criticism for how they handled sexual misconduct allegations involving a teacher and student. Three candidates are challenging two incumbents for the board seats. The challengers, David Pyatt, Abby Morgan, and Joe Brooks, answered questions at a Facebook Live forum moderated by our Kara Kenny. All three say they would improve transparency and accountability. I'm going to ask questions, I'm going to ask tough questions, and I'm not going to sit there and 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 nod my head or or you know just not ask them. When when given the opportunity to do the right thing, I'm going to take that road every time. Who do you want in there as your voice? Whether it's for the kids' safety, whether I'm, whether uh, to the parents out there that feel like their situation is unique and they need a voice, who do you want as your voice? Who do you want in there to make sure that they're heard and is not going away? And that's me. I see a need for the people of this community to have someone on the board that they know that they can trust, that they know has the kids' best interests at heart. Um, and I believe that I provide that. I believe that my many community um, involvements um, makes me accessible to people in this community. Thank you so much, Abby, Joe, Dave. If you missed the forum, you can watch it on our website, wrtv.com. The incumbents declined to participate. And, and vote. <laughs> Coming up, how the pandemic is impacting an industry that's dominated by women.
station working for you. This is WRTV News at 11, streaming now. Never seen a bull, never. <laughs> it was a little scary there for a while when he started coming at you. <laughs> Well, this was an unbelievable scene on the southeast side of Indianapolis this morning. Debbie Van Trees woke up to a mess in her backyard, broken bird feeder, overturned chairs, and smashed flower pots. The culprit? This runaway bull. After some initial shock and concern, Van Trees and neighbors could see the bull was not aggressive. They watched from a distance as he went from yard to yard, chewing on trees and flowers until the owner arrived to corral him away. Actually, I thought it was pretty cool. I'm a, I'm a real animal lover, so I thought this is this is a great way to start my day. Mm -hmm. but he, and he left a little fertilizer for our garden, too. <laughs> well, Boone the Bull is now back home at Filler Family Farms, a rescue for farm animals. I can't imagine just seeing that in my backyard, Kevin. <laughs> What a sight. I think it would be exciting for a while. And I think they finally enticed him with a bucket of food. And then he just followed that. And that's how they captured him. Gotcha. I can follow, only imagine just like the dog's reaction to that. <laughs> Leo would let you know that something unusual was visiting the house, I'm sure. Okay, unusual for the first weekend of fall somewhat. Temperatures will be above average 84 as we go into Saturday. This is the temperature climb. It's also the top of the mountain on Saturday. From there, temperatures will slide the other way next week and it will be a noticeable change. Sunday will hang in there with temperatures still around uh, 83. Early next week, a stronger storm system. The, the wind will be a part of this as low pressure deepens. It will give us a west-northwest wind, draw much cooler air into the state. All indications are it will be here to stay for a while as well. Monday, still 75, but by Wednesday, you'll need a jacket, probably wearing long pants, and the temperature's in the 40s overnight. It'll definitely change the way you dress. And it looks like that'll stay around for a while, as I mentioned, through October 7th. This is the forecast keeping temperatures below average, which would keep highs in the 60s, lows in the 40s on many occasions. Uh, nothing within the forecast here seven day or shortly thereafter in the next couple of weeks indicates that we're going to break our dry pattern with any real soaking rain during the day tomorrow. Mixture of clouds and sunshine, wind out of the southwest, a nice day, 78 make it 36 days where we've only had four hundredths of an inch of rain. Dry stretch lingers on into Friday as well. Temperatures close to 80 for the afternoon high. That's the way we end the work week as you look at your Friday night. Football should be nice, mostly clear. Wind out of the south, temperatures falling into the 60s. These overnight lows that earlier in the week were in the 40s are starting to warm up a bit. We'll be in the 60s for overnight lows as we get into Sunday for sure. The chance of thunderstorms on Sunday, just 30%. But early next week, and then another cold front comes through, a reinforcing shot of cooler temperatures. That will at least keep a chance for showers around Monday and Tuesday. Temperatures really bottom out as we get to Wednesday. That's the day where you'll think, woo, it's quite cool. 64 degrees after starting at 48 in the morning. No snow in the forecast. There's a positive. Amanda? Always a good thing. Thanks, Kevin. Tomorrow, President Trump is scheduled to pay his respects to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. For the next two days, the late justice's casket will sit on the steps of the Supreme Court. ABC's Andrew Dimbert reports as the mourning period continues, the president and Republican leaders are moving forward with replacement plans. After decades championing civil and women's rights in the hallowed halls of the nation's highest court, the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg honored today in the place she served for 27 years. Her casket arriving at the Supreme Court for her memorial service. The eight remaining justices together for the first time since the COVID pandemic began to mourn the loss of an institutional icon and colleague. Among the words that best describe Ruth, tough, brave, a fighter, a winner. President Bill Clinton, who appointed Ginsburg to the bench, paying his respects today. Tomorrow, President Trump will do the same. But alongside the tributes and solemn celebration, a nasty political fight is unfolding from Capitol Hill to the White House. Republicans should for once be straight with the American people. They are fighting to reverse Judge Ginsburg's legacy, not honor it. 
The president and GOP-led Senate are moving forward to fill Ginsburg's seat before the November election. I can only repeat that uh, we have an obligation under the Constitution, should we choose to take advantage of it, uh, to fill the vacancy. Democrats slamming their rivals across the aisle, accusing the Republicans of hypocrisy. Just four years ago, when President Obama sought to replace the late Justice Antonin Scalia, Republicans stopped the nomination, claiming it was too close to an election. That was nine months before voters went to the polls. This time, it's not even nine weeks. But the party insists this time is different because Republicans control the Senate and the White House. Saturday at 5 o'clock in the Rose Garden, where I'll be putting forth my nominee for Supreme Court Justice. On Friday, Ginsburg will lie in state at the Capitol, the first woman ever to do so. And then just a day later, President Trump will announce his pick to fill her seat. Ginsburg, meanwhile, her final resting place will be at the Arlington National Cemetery. Her funeral is next week. She'll be buried next to her husband. Andrew Dimbert, ABC News, the Supreme Court. Hiring Hoosiers is WRTV's commitment to connecting you to career training, education, and opportunities. Four Hendricks County companies are teaming up for a virtual job fair tomorrow morning. Becton Dickinson & Company, Geotis, Harlan Bakeries, Weston Foods, and Maplehurst Bakeries are taking part. The event goes from 1030 to 1130. For more info and a link to register, go to HiringHoosiers.com. And tomorrow and Friday from noon to 7, Best Buy is hosting job fairs at stores across the country. To fill seasonal holiday positions, you could be interviewed and hired on the spot. Positions in a variety of departments are available. Oh, the socket locket is an adhesive card holder um, where you can hold up to one, two, or three cards securely in place. You may remember this product and this young entrepreneur from our Hiring Hoosiers series. Katie Gellahausen created the Socket Locket product that sticks to your phone and allows you to use both a phone grip and you can store your cards at the same time. We traveled to Elwood and Progressive Plastics where Hoosiers manufacture her product. Now the Cicero native is up for a really big opportunity and she tells us this could bring even more jobs to the Hoosier state. Katie is selected to pitch her product to buyers at the 2020 Walmart Open Call. This is her big opportunity to get her product made right here near her hometown onto store shelves of this big box retailer. Out of 14,000 applications, Katie's product is now a finalist. Sometimes the buyers do go ahead and make a decision on the spot, but usually the buyer, that's just the starting point of relationship with Walmart. Even like a regional contract, it would be huge for um, Socket Locket. Hopefully we have a large purchase order and hopefully we can bring a lot of jobs here to the area. Katie's presentation will be on October 1st. If you want to learn more about her story, visit HiringHoosiers.com. COVID-19 is, of course, impacting many industries. That includes the beauty business. Scripps reporter Kai Beach shows how cosmetology schools are changing how they educate students and why many are now questioning their options after graduation. In an industry like cosmetology, where all services revolve around hair, skin, and nails, getting up close and personal to people oh, my nails just started popping off. <laughs> is a big part of the job. For those looking to make a career in the beauty biz, the pandemic has left an ugly spot. Donna Kramer is the executive director at Empire Beauty School. She says COVID-19 initially caused the campus to close. It recently reopened with new restrictions set by the local health department. Class sizes are smaller, fewer clients can come in due to social distancing, and all students have to wear masks. Because mine and your skin is the same. But the area that's seen the biggest hit is attendance. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, employment of hairstylists and cosmetologists is projected to drop by 1% by the end of the decade, leaving many students concerned that their career opportunities are going down the drain. Alexis Lovato is a cosmetology student and says many of her classmates are concerned about their employment options once this training is complete. Thank <laughs> you. 
Kramer says despite the challenges, students are still getting their hours in. And while hands-on training may be a little different, it's a style they can adapt to. I'm Kai Beach reporting. NASCAR's playoffs continue this weekend. Two young drivers with Hoosier roots have championship hopes. WRTV's Brad Brown shows both could be on their way to big-time success. They are often called the next generation of stock car racing's stars. But for the dozen drivers in NASCAR's Xfinity Series playoffs, it feels like their time is now. And among them are a pair of Hoosiers. Chase Briscoe from Mitchell, Indiana, and Winamax Justin Haley. Both already have big wins this season and their eyes on a bigger prize. You can't let the championship define you um, and define your season. Um, yes, we want to win the championship, but at the same time, winning races is, is a big deal. Briscoe was the Xfinity Series Rookie of the Year in 2019. His July win at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway was just a sliver of his success in 2020. The races that we've won have, have been racetracks that I feel like are kind of driver racetracks uh, between Darlington, Bristol, Homestead, you know, places like that. And I think I've, I feel like I've proven my worth uh, in the sport. Last weekend, he won again at Bristol, giving him seven Xfinity race wins on the year, best in the series. Briscoe shares the points lead with Austin Sindrick as the playoffs begin. I feel confident that we can make it to the Final Four, but... Um, you know, I don't know if there's really one guy that sticks out um, over any others. I feel like anybody on any given day can be the guy to beat. Haley has had just two wins this year, but they came at NASCAR's two biggest tracks, Daytona and Talladega. Justin Haley went to the bottom, and Justin Haley is oh going to win. Haley had his NASCAR breakthrough last July with a stunning Cup Series victory at Daytona. I don't know. There's been no magical piece, right? We didn't just, like, sit around around a boardroom we're like man this is gonna get us from 10th to first it, i mean it's just been every little thing every little detail um each and every week briscoe is 25 years old haley just 21. both seem to be in line for a full-time move to nascar's top ranks soon every step is so big um that it takes a while so um i don't think you'll ever be ready but i'm pretty happy with my progress for for being a young driver and not having a lot of experience um I, I can't say I wouldn't change much. You know, last year, I, I'd only won one race. So, you know, I'm not that, that pretty girl at the dance that everybody wants. You know, I'm, I'm now that I've won seven races, I'm a lot more wanted in, in the sport. So it's totally different. There are seven races left on the NASCAR Xfinity Series schedule. It starts this weekend in Las Vegas. They'll cut the playoff field to eight drivers after Charlotte, and then the four that make it to the end will race for the title in Phoenix. It's a solid chance that one or both of these Indiana guys are in contention that final weekend. Brad Brown, WRTV Sports. Definitely starting to notice splashes of color out there. Couldn't help but take this eye-level photo of some leaves in my yard. Bright red. Okay, temperatures climbing slowly and then noticeably for Saturday up to 84 degrees. Only in the 60s for highs by the middle of next week. Amanda? Thanks for making WRTV your choice for news. Good morning, Indiana. Starts at 430.